Hi. Viruses and bacteria are maybe very tiny, but they are major components of the natural world. Today we're going to explore the genetics of, of bacteria and viruses, and I hope some of the principles that you learn will be useful for, for you when we explore more complicated organisms in future lectures. So I hope you enjoy the lecture, and here is the voiceover. This is an electron micrograph of phage infecting bacteria. The phage are in green and the bacterial cell is in brown. You can see a little green strand coming through the cell wall and cell membrane of the, the bacteria. And this is a single strand of DNA that is infecting the bacteria. By understanding the relationship between the phage and the bacteria, we have learned a lot about both viral and bacterial genetics, it has led to some crucial insights that have been applicable to eukaryotes. Here's Vibrio cholerae, the agent of cholera. And this is, of course, a bacteria, and it's a unicellular organism with no nuclear membrane. And most bacteria, but not actually this particular one, have a single circular chromosome. Here's an example of what that chromosome would look like when you um, rupture a bacterial cell. You can see all of this DNA coming out of the cell. So bacteria and viruses have a lot of advantages for genetic studies. And some of this, of course, is related to their relatively small genomes. So reproduction is rapid. Many progeny are produced. Haploid genomes allow all mutations to be expressed directly. So you don't have to do crosses, let's say like you would do in a fly or a mouse. Asexual reproduction simplifies the isolation of genetically pure strains. Growth in the laboratory is easy and requires little space. Um, although this is not true with highly pathogenic bacteria, but with E. coli, which is mostly the, the main workhorse of genetic and genetics in the lab, it's, it's very easy to use. The genomes are, are small for bacteria and viruses, and techniques are available for isolating and manipulating their genes. They have medical importance, which increases their relevance. They can also be used in genetic engineering to produce substances of commercial use. So how do we culture bacteria? There are two basic ways. You can do it either in liquid or in a solid substrate. So in liquid medium, you have sterile liquid that you inoculate with bacteria uh, from another source, and then the bacteria rapidly divides. In the case of E. coli, they divide about every 20 minutes under optimal nutritional and um, temperature and oxygenation uh, conditions. The media, of course, is very important. So you have to, this sterile liquid medium that you inoculate into must have all the nutrients that are necessary to support bacterial growth. You can also culture bacteria on a solid substrate. And this is what petri dishes are used for. Basically, you have to dilute the DNA, spread it on the plate with a glass rod, and then you get colonies that you can streak out and isolate. Each colony consists of genetically identical cells. So this is very useful in a lot of molecular biology applications. And here's an example of a Petri dish with E. coli on it. And you can see that there's different sized colonies, and obviously someone streaked out the word E. coli here. As you look more closely, you can see here that E. coli are these rod-shaped bacteria. You can see in this particular shot, some of them are in the process of cell division. There are a lot of different ways that you can use petri dishes to isolate colonies of a particular type. 
So one technique is replica plating. So let's say you have bacteria that have formed colonies and you have um, this velvet surface that has been sterilized. You can touch that to the plate with the colonies and then inoculate two different plates, let's say. One that has medium lacking leucine in this example and one that has complete medium. So only leucine plus bacteria can grow on the plate that lacks leucine, whereas on the plate that has complete medium, all the colonies can grow. So you can see the missing colony on the plate that doesn't contain leucine correlates with a colony that is on the complete medium plate. The fact that it's missing in one and present on the other allows us to conclude that that particular colony is a leucine mutant colony. So it's leucine minus, and then we can culture that and then verify that that is true. Bacteria are mostly haploid. They usually have a single circular chromosomes, but there are a number that have multiple chromosomes, such as Vibrio cholera and Rhizobium melilloti, which has three. The number of genes varies between different bacteria, but one thing that is pretty consistent is that a large percentage of the bacterial genome is protein coding, um, usually around 90%. This is in sharp contrast to eukaryotes like humans, where only 1% of the human genome is protein coding. This suggests that the bacterial genome has less complex regulation of its gene, genes, among other things. Beyond their usually single chromosome, bacteria can also have extra chromosomal DNA. So these are called plasmids, and they often confer upon the bacteria beneficial phenotypes such as antibiotic resistance, or the ability to undergo conjugation, which we will discuss later. Plasmids replicate independently, and the ratio of plasmid to chromosome varies where there's low, middle, and high copy number plasmids. Plasmid DNA is very important in molecular biology. It's used to clone genes, and you can also create design DNA constructs for many applications, such as cell culture, or um, transgenesis, things like this. Some plasmids are capable of free replication or integrating into the chromosome, and these are called episomes. Plasmids replicate in this manner. So there is, the plasmid of course is circular double-stranded DNA. On a certain side of the plasmid, there is an origin of replication, which is marked here in yellow in this figure. So this is an ori site. Replication begins at this site, and you begin to synthesize new DNA. And you can see this here on the bottom with this uh, electron micrograph of a bacterial plasmid. You can see there's um, synthesis starting at the origin of replication. As the synthesis continues, you eventually get separation of the daughter plasmids, and then each of the daughter plasmids contain a new strand and an old strand. One of the ways in which uh, bacteria have been used, particularly to understand some fundamental principles about genetics, is, there, is the ability to select them for their nutrient requirements. So there are prototrophs. These use simple ingredients to synthesize everything they need, so they can survive on a very minimal medium. A minimal medium is a medium with nutrients that will allow the, the wild type bacteria to grow. Oxotropes, however, cannot grow a minimal medium unless it is supplemented with, with other things such as amino acids. And this, a medium that is supplemented is called a complete medium. And it has all the substances required for growth. So the bacteria do not have to synthesize, let's say, an amino acid themselves. So you can also create selective media that select for certain bacteria based upon their lack of an ability to 
synthesize an amino acid. And this has been very useful to understand how bacteria, for example, exchange genetic material. In 1946, Joshua Lederberg and Edward Tatum demonstrated that bacteria can transfer and recombine genetic information. And I'm going to go through some of their experiments right now. And they did this using two oxytrophic mutants. They had one that couldn't synthesize three important nutrients. And this could not grow in minimal medium because it was missing the ability to synthesize th these three important components. And then they had another strain that was incapable of synthesizing three other important nutrients. Now, this is sort of like the reciprocal. So one of them could synthesize the, the three that the other could not, right? If you put these two strains together, if there was any exchange of genetic material, you might get a bacterial cell and a colony, let's say on a plate, that can grow in, the, in minimal medium. So they did this experiment. So they mix the Y10 and the Y24, these two different strains. They found that, yes, genetic exchange and recombination took place between these two mutant strains, which allowed for wild-type colonies to form on this minimal media plate. But there were only a few colonies, right? And the only way that they would grow is if the strains had become wild type for all these different essential nutrients. So they wondered, is this some sort of spontaneous or simultaneous mutation where they, they just, you got these revertants. So basically somehow whatever mutation that was causing those genes to, to not function, somehow that was spontaneously fixed, right? And that seems like a possibility, but a more rare possibility. It's more likely that this, this experiment suggested that there was a genetic exchange. So how did they prove this? Bernard Davis came up with a chamber, in a sense, to test the question. This one of these, the question here. Does genetic exchange require the contact between the two strains? So he constructed a U-shaped tube, and this tube had a filter in between that will allow the medium to flow through but not the bacteria to touch. And then they applied suction to either end to make sure that the media was flowing through this bacterial culture. And then they plated the results. And what they got in this case is no growth. So for, for some reason, even though before the some sort of recombination had occurred where you could get wild-type colonies. In this case, you couldn't get any wild-type colonies. And of course, they did controls where they had complete me media, and then you could see colonies. But there were no colonies on the minimal media. The idea that they thought of was that there was a, a necessity for direct contact for genetic exchange. So it is clear that in order to get wild type colonies, you would have to go through recombination of these two strains. And let me just walk you through this a little bit. So you would have your triple mutant strain that was wild type for three other important enzymes that, that make nutrients. Then you have your other strain that has a reciprocal mutations. And of course, wild type, a recombination event must have occurred. Then you get a prototroph where you have all wild type copies of the gene and of all six genes, and then this colony would survive. And then you get an oxytroph, which actually requires all of these nutrients to survive. So this suggests that DNA was transferred, obviously and that the selective media will only allow the prototroph to grow. And that recombination occurs between homologous regions. And this idea of homologous recombination 
is very influential and also occurs in eukaryotes. So how does gene, this gene transfer occur? It could occur through conjugation, transformation, or transduction. Conjugation is the physical contact between cells and it involves the transfer of DNA of either a plasmid or a chromosome from one bacteria to another. There is a donor and a recipient. The donor does not receive any DNA. It only provides it. In transformation, DNA from the surrounding media is taken up. It is, it is natural, but can be manipulated both chemically or electrically. And here's an example. So you have DNA fragments that are in the environment and they are taken up by the cell and through recombination, you can get insertion into the bacterial chromosome. You can also take up entire plasmids this way and then you would have both a bacterial chromosome and a plasmid in the cell if, if you chose that route. In transduction, bacterial viruses can carry DNA from one bacteria to another. And this happens rarely, but at a, at a measurable amount in bacteriophage infection of bacterial cells. And under certain circumstances, the, the phage infection causes the, the lysis and destruction of the bacterial chromosome. Pieces of the bacterial chromosome can be packaged into the capsid of the phage and then transferred to another bacteria. Then, with some luck, that piece of DNA will have some homologous sequences to the bacteria that it has infected. And then, through homologous recombination, you get um, the integration of a new gene into the bacterial chromosome. But in the case of Lederberg, Tedum, and Davis, especially Davis's modification of the experiment, you can see that conjugation is the way that gene transfer occurred in this situation, is that is the only method of gene transfer that we've described that re requires the physical contact of bacterial cells. So let's explore bacterial conjugation or mating. So Lederberg and Tatum continued to study this, and what they found is that there is these sex pili here, which is uh, shown on the left as this long red string-like thing that is connecting these two different bacteria. And what happens is a donor cell that is positive for the F factor, which is the fertility factor, donates the DNA on that is in contained within this F factor plasmid to the recipient via the sex pili. And if you look on the right, you can see that this F factor contains all the sequences that are necessary to create the sex pili. And also it can replicate on its own and has a number of um, important sequences that are necessary for this process of conjugation. And this F factor is an epizone, so it can integrate into the bacterial chromosome. When bacteria conjugate with an F plasma, there are four stages. Formation of a specific donor-recipient contact through the sex pili. Preparation for DNA transfer. This is a mobilization stage. DNA transfer and the formation of a functional plasmid that can replicate. This requires hair-like appendages called the sex pili, as I described. There are usually one to three per cell, and they're basically just a hollow tube. Or ET, which is the transfer origin, and it gets nicked by plasmid proteins. And this initiates rolling circle replication. It also requires the tra genes, which are a form of tra operon. And operons are groups of genes that are expressed together 
in bacteria. And we'll talk about this a little more when we talk about gene expression in bacteria. And there's DNA synthesis that occurs in both the donor and the recipient. In HFR cells, you have the integration of the F factor into the chromosome. And this can serve as the, the donor. Um, and we'll see this in action in the video that's coming up. And HFR sir, uh, stands for the high frequency of gene transfer. So here's a video on conjugation. In this animation, you'll see how conjugation can be occur and how it can be used for mapping the locations of genes, which is also interesting. So I hope you enjoy it. During normal bacterial conjugation, about 1 in 10,000 recipients of the fertility factor, F, become HFR bacteria. This occurs when the F factor integrates into the cell chromosome. When an HFR bacterium mates with an F- recipient, one DNA strand is cut at the F origin. The free 5' prime end moves through the transfer pore while the chromosome replicates. The donor strand is replicated as it enters the recipient. When the cells separate, the donor cell chromosome is restored. In the recipient, integration events may lead to recombination of gene alleles. Linear DNA is eventually degraded. When many HFR and F- bacteria are mixed, conjugating pairs can form quickly. F origins are nicked and donor strands begin to move into recipients at about the same time in all established pairs. Donor genes closest to the leading sides of the F origins are transferred early. Donor genes residing farther from the F origins are transferred later, some more than an hour later if pairing is maintained. At any time, mating might be interrupted. If the F- recipient is drug resistant, drug treatment can eliminate the HFR bacteria. Then one can check for F- recombinants among survivors. This kind of synchronous HFR mating can be used to determine the gene order on the donor chromosome. F- recipients are chosen that are streptomycin resistant and carry three mutant genes that could recombine with wild type alleles from the donors. The recipients are mated with HFR donors that carry these wild type alleles and are streptomycin sensitive. As conjugation begins, the F origin is nicked and DNA strand transfer starts. Once the F origin and streptomycin gene enter the recipient, we start the mating clock. After four minutes, we interrupt mating, add streptomycin, and test for recombinants among F- survivors. None are found. If we wait until eight minutes to interrupt mating, we find that the azide resistance allele has been transferred. After 16 minutes of mating, our results show that the donor lactose gene has also transferred. After 24 minutes of mating, our results show that the donor galactose gene has transferred as well. Recombinant analysis reveals the order of donor genes behind the F origin, azide, lac, then gal. Transformation is another way that DNA transfer can occur. It re requires the uptake of DNA from the environment by the bacterial cell. Cells that take up DNA are said to be competent, and we call them in the lab. We, we buy competent cells from uh, biotech companies, and we use them in the lab all the time. You can also make them yourself if you're skilled with bacteria. Transformation was important in determining that DNA is the genetic material that is responsible for heredity and is like the basis of genetics. Transformation works like this. You have a bacteria that contains a chromosome that has recipient DNA, and then you have double-stranded fragments of DNA that are in the medium. 
one of the strands is hydrolyzed and the other strand is associated with proteins. The single-stranded DNA that results can pair with homologous regions and integrates using recombination. The hydrolyzed strand is then degraded and then you get transformants. So when the cell divides, half of the bacteria will be transformed and the other half will not be transformed. And if you remember from the plasmid DNA replication, each of the plasmids have one of the strands of the original plasmid, right? So the same is true for the bacterial chromosome. So how does transformation occur? Here you can see a bacterial cell at the bottom of the screen that has DNA in green, and then you can see um, the bacteria, which is in brown, and then it has this blue dot, which is representing the bacterial chromosome. So you can use chemical or electroporation methods to get the DNA inside the cell. These treatments of the cells make them more permeable. So you can use heat shock or you can apply electric field. And this technique is very important in cloning, genetic engineering, and all recombinant DNA technology. You can insert plasmids this way, which is the key thing. And it works sort of like this. So you have your method, either chemical or electroporation. And then the competent cells are more permeable to the DNA. And then the DNA enters a bacterial cell. And then you select for colonies that contain that DNA using a selective marker. This has been used in bacterial genetics to look at the proximity of genes. Let's say you have a donor cell, you break up the DNA in that donor cell, and you transform the recipient cell, and you look at the rate in which two genes are transformed together. These are co-transformed genes. If they are transferred together more of the time, it is because they are physically closer. And this is clear that A and B are closer than C. So now take a break. We're going to switch from bacteria to viral genetics and enjoy this photo from Andreas Gursky. Viral genetics is a very important part of genetics. And here we have some electron micrographs showing bacteriophage. These phages are viruses that infect bacteria. So here's a closer look at the structure of phage. So on the left you have a 2D image and on the right you have a 3D image. And DNA is held inside the head, which is like the capsid, a viral capsid. And basically it is a system where you have DNA and protein working together to simply transmit DNA from one host cell to another host cell. Now, viruses cannot replicate on their own. They all require host cells. So they hijack the machinery of the host cell to reproduce themselves. So phages go through both lytic and latent cycles. A phage infects a bacterial cell. The DNA enters. It is injected by this um, capsid. And this can trigger the degradation of the host DNA. The phage DNA is then replicated and the phage protein components are synthesized 
mature phages are assembled, the DNA enters into the protein complex, then the host cell is lysed and the phage is released and can affect other bacterial cells. So lysogeny is a latent phase of the phage's life cycle. So in this case, you have a prophage, which is a bacteriophage that has integrated its DNA into the nucleoid of a host bacterium. And the resulting cell is called a lysogen. It's a host with an integrated phage. As the bacterium replicates, the prophage replicates as a part of the bacterium's nucleoid, as you can see here. A phage has a choice of either a lysogenic or lytic life cycle. This has been the workhorse of phage genetic. The lambda phage is a temperate phage that can go both through lysogenic and lytic cycles. And this is very useful because it can be used to package DNA. And this occurs in generalized transduction where you have a defective phage where bacterial DNA is packaged instead of phage DNA. Then in the subsequent infection of another cell with a defective phage, bacterial DNA is injected by the phage. And this is integrated into the bacter bacterial genome in a process, as we discussed, as transduction. This cell that has DNA from another bacteria that came to it via a phage is called a transductant. Generalized transduction is, is a rare event. It happens in one to 100,000 to one in a million infections. It requires that the phage degrades the host DNA, that the phage package the host DNA non-specifically, that, and also that the DNA that is transferred recombines with the recipient cell DNA. Only 1% of the bacter bacterial chromosome can be transduced. And genes that are close together will be co-transduced, which is useful for mapping because you can figure out how close they are to each other. Since these phages can transfer any DNA, it is called generalized transduction. Not all viruses infect bacteria, as we well know. There are many viruses that infect eukaryotes, prokaryotes, and you know, even us. We have the influenza virus, rhinovirus, measles virus, and of course we have the T4-lytic phage, which infects bacteria. Viruses can be helical or icosahedral. So this is different kind of shapes of viruses. The genome can be DNA or RNA, and the genome can be single-stranded or double-stranded, and this includes double-stranded RNA as well as DNA. The genome can also be circular or linear. For example, of retroviruses, we have a virus that contains a RNA that is inside a capsid, this viral protein coat, the capsid, and then it is a single-stranded RNA genome, a viral envelope that surrounds the capsid and the core shell proteins. And these viral envelope glycoproteins are really important in viral entry, particularly in the example of HIV, which I'm going to show you a video about right now. So this is HIV. It's a typical retrovirus, meaning that it has an outer envelope. And in the center, it has two copies of RNA, as well as an enzyme here in blue that's reverse transcriptase, which will ultimately turn that RNA into DNA. Um, the, the virus itself, with this outer envelope protein, uh, actually directly infects T helper cells. The way that it does this is that as it comes up to the cell surface, 
It uses receptors that are on T helper cells and exclusive to T helper cells, which are CD4 molecule, which really defines T helper cells. It's a surface receptor that binds to the envelope protein. It, that causes a conformational change and allows a second receptor to grab hold of the envelope. This is the chemokine co-receptor. It's also called CCR5, and we'll talk about that more. What happens now is that the, the, the stalk of the envelope protein pierces through the, uh, from the virus into the, into the host cell and starts to draw the two cell membrane, the cell membrane and the viral membrane together. And what ultimately happens is fusion of those two membranes and the viral genetic material is injected essentially into the cell and the envelope protein is left at the cell surface. The virus has a matrix and a capsid protein shown here in green and red that, that essentially are digested when it enters into the cell. That releases the viral enzymes and the viral RNA. And here we have reverse transcriptase, which takes the viral RNA and using host nucleotides, converts that viral RNA into a single strand of DNA. While it does that, it makes some random errors, which is characteristic of reverse transcriptase. It has very poor proofreading activity. That single-stranded DNA now is again reverse transcribed into a double-stranded DNA. At that point, another enzyme that has come in with the virus in the beginning called integrase essentially grabs hold of that double-stranded DNA and carries it through a nuclear pore into the nucleus of the cell. Within the nucleus of the cell, it finds the host chromosome, and it basically, the integrase enzyme, makes a nick in the host DNA and allows for HIV to insert itself into the host chromosome. And that right there is what establishes lifelong infection. Now, RNA polymerase comes along and makes messenger RNA. Those messenger RNAs encode for different viral proteins. They end up associating with ribosomes on the, at the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And here's a piece of mRNA that's making envelope protein, which is directly produced into the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's shuttled then through the endoplasmic reticulum and taken to the cell surface, where at the cell surface, it becomes embedded in the cellular membrane and at this point, coalescing with other envelope proteins that have been produced, you have this cluster of envelope proteins now on the surface of this infected cell. At the same time, there are other messenger RNAs that are being produced that allow for translation of other uh, viral proteins. So here are additional viral proteins being made, which are going to be used to make up the key components that, uh, that the virus ultimately is going to need. These are transported again to the cell surface to the area where these envelope proteins are, and a strand of RNA as well as a, some of the enzymes are part of that complex. This then buds off at the cell surface at this point, but it's still not a mature virion because the polyprotein chain needs to still be digested into its component parts. That's done by an enzyme called protease. Protease breaks up those uh, polyprotein chains and ultimately allows for them to coalesce and form the mature uh, structures that make up the final virion. And now you have a mature infectious virion that can go on now to infect other cells. Once that happens now, the cell can produce tons of viruses, and this is really what then keeps the whole process going. Dengue is another virus. Of course, this is a virus that is spread by mosquitoes and of, of particular interest to me personally. Um, it is a plus sense RNA virus, and I'm going to now show you a video about how Dengue infects cells. Dengue virus is an RNA virus. Its outer surface is covered with envelope proteins surrounding a lipid bilayer envelope. Inside the envelope is a capsid shell that contains the virus's RNA genome. 
Immune cells are targeted by the dengue virus. There are two cell surface receptor molecules important in dengue infection. The cognate receptor is involved in normal infection, and the FC receptor is involved in a phenomenon called antibody-dependent enhancement. The virus's envelope protein binds to the cognate receptor and triggers a cellular process called receptor-mediated endocytosis. The virus is internalized in a bubble-like structure called the endosome. When endosomes form, proton pumps lower the pH of the interior. The virus responds to the lowered pH by changing the conformation of the envelope proteins to form spike-like structures. The tips of the spikes are hydrophobic, which allows them to penetrate the endosome's membrane. They bend until the endosome's membrane and the virus's membrane fuse together and release the capsid into the cytoplasm. The capsid breaks apart and releases the viral RNA. The viral RNA travels to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It is a positive sense strand and can be directly translated into proteins. The ends of the RNA form structures that bind to translation initiation proteins. The complex attaches to the ribosome to initiate translation. The whole viral genome is translated as a single, long polyprotein chain. The capsid protein is on the cytoplasm side of the endoplasmic reticulum. The envelope protein and the pre-membrane protein are in the lumen side and are activated by the host's peptidase enzyme. In the cytoplasm, one of the viral proteins, a protease enzyme, activates all the other proteins in the polyprotein chain. These proteins aggregate to form the RNA replication complex. The viral RNA is synthesized in multiple steps. First, the ends of the viral RNA fold up and the RNA forms a circle. The RNA then attaches to the replication complex to start the first round of synthesis. Using the virus's positive sense RNA as the template, a negative sense copy is made. The pair of RNA strands forms a double helix. The RNA then becomes a circle again. This time, the negative sense strand acts as a template to make a positive sense strand. Many copies of the positive sense RNA are made by repeated cycles of RNA synthesis. Some of these strands are translated to make more viral proteins. Eventually, enough proteins are made to assemble new viruses. The envelope proteins aggregate in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, and the capsid proteins aggregate on the cytoplasmic side. A viral RNA binds to the capsid protein and is packaged into a new virus particle as it buds off into the endoplasmic reticulum. The virus is still immature. Its pre-membrane proteins cover the tips of the envelope proteins to prevent premature fusion back into the cell. The virus buds off and travels through the Golgi apparatus and continues toward the cell surface. Before reaching the surface, the pre-membrane protein is processed and the virus becomes mature. New dengue viruses are released from the cell, ready to infect other cells. So here are some genetic terms and concepts. Prototrophic bacterium, a wild type bacterium that can use a carbon source, essential elements such as nitrogen and phosphorus, certain vitamins and other required ions and nutrients to synthesize all the compounds that they need for growth and reproduction. So these are the prototrophs. Oxotrophic bacteria, a bacterium, or you can also do this in fungus and yeast and things like that, that possesses a nutritional mutation that disrupts its ability to synthesize an essential biological molecule. It cannot grow on minimal medium, but can grow on minimal medium that has been supplemented with the biological mo molecule that it cannot synthesize. A plasmid, a small circular DNA molecule found in bacterial cells that is capable of replicating independently from the bacterial chromosome.
conjugation, a mechanism by which genetic material can be exchanged between bacterial cells. In conjugation, two bacteria lie close together and a cytoplasmic connection forms between them. This is the sex pili. A plasmid, or sometimes a part of the bacterial chromosome, passes through this connection from one cell to the other. Transformation. Mechanism by which DNA found in the medium is taken up by the cell. After transformation, recombination may take place between the introduced genes and the cellular chromosome. Transduction. A type of gene exchange that takes place when a virus carries genes from one bacterium to another. After it is inside the cell, the newly introduced DNA may undergo recombination with the bacterial chromosome. Virus, a non-cellular replicating agent consisting of a nucleic acid surrounded by a protein coat, can, can replicate only within its host cell. Retrovirus, a RNA virus capable of integrating its genetic material into the genome of its host. The virus injects its RNA genome into the host cell where reverse transcription produces a complementary double-stranded DNA molecule from the RNA template. The DNA copy then integrates into the host chromosome to form a provirus, and this is similar to the lysogenic stage of phage and bacteria. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. Next time, we're going to focus on DNA structure. See you then.